You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. And you have tuned in to The Mountain Gardener. This is your host, Ken Lane, the hostess with the mostest, at least for gardening, at least. So we go over the plants. We're in this season of transition, fall. It's it's September, so it's just fall is uh, what, two weeks away. So it's officially into summer, and you can kind of feel that in the air, can't you? Just this tinge. It's not as hot at night. It just doesn't get quite – the sun isn't, isn't even as, as intense where your skin just – Sizzles like bacon. It's better. So fall's a nice time. It's also a nice time for your gardens. This is probably one of the best times to be planting trees. And so we've gotten a lot of trees in here at, at Waters Garden Center at least. There's this season now through October where garden centers in the mountains of Arizona will be shipping their spruce, their pine, their firs, uh, the uh, cypress, the cedars, the maples, the aspens, the elms, there's a whole series. Some fruit trees will be shipping plants in because you're trying to get them in and acclimated or used to your climate. So they transition from our fall, from, from where they were grown, they get transitioned or, or used to our environment. So they go into that fall and then winter transition. And so they're hardier, they're more robust. And so we know, plus we're gearing up for the fall color. So we're famous. The mountains of Arizona are famous for our fall color. So maples and aspens are probably the two most famous. Uh, and, and for you folks from California, it's not, it's not, or even, I guess, Midwest, Japanese maples are not as robust here. They, they grow, but they got to be in just the right spot. No sun, no wind. And so if you plant them in the shade, the north side of the house and that uh, cut out by the front door where it's got a, a, that overhang. Uh, Lisa and I, we grow ours in, in a con- container at the uh, front door right there where you where you ring the doorbell. There's a Japanese maple. So it's shaded. It's protected. And it does really well. But if you put one right outside, right in the yard, like the tag says it can, it'll burn on you. It'll do just fine now through winter, it'll leaf out in spring, and then come next summer, the tips will start to burn. It will just struggle. So you got to do a little bit of homework. This is one, if you're from other areas and you hear, oh, fall is for planting. It's a good time to plant. I'm tired of my neighbors. I want a privacy screen. You can plant now, but you got to do some homework. You don't do it. If you're from Chicago or Illinois, that area, the Midwest, you, you need some help. Come talk to some plant experts to really hone up on your 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 research before you commit to planting on the varieties because a, a Japanese maple may have grown in full sun out where you're you where you're from but here it doesn't so you really want to transition and get used to it uh, poor folks from Southern Cal Palm Springs Tucson Phoenix Scottsdale you folks really ba- basically everything that you know. Just just erase, reboot, and start over because the seasons are totally different. The plants are completely different. Even the fruit trees are different. What varieties you plant are different. So you really, this is where you need to come alongside a friend, a garden neighbor that knows their stuff. You can tell they're a gardener because look at their yard. It's just beautiful. Knock on the door and gardeners love to show off their gardens. You may never get out of there. You'll be having lunch tea, cookies. You'll be having dinner before you get out, seeing all the gardens and all the ins and outs, but you'll be an expert. So I like to lean over the fence and chat with, with neighbors that I know are gardeners because you just share some stuff and it just, it's interesting. You can see each other's gardens. It's fun. That's part of what gardening is. Or you find a good, reputable garden center. I'm not talking box store. They don't have a clue what they're talking about in my, purely my opinion. So I'm just, I go in and i I hear some of the advice, and I just cringe, and I put my head down, and I walk away. So you need some real, I mean, if you need to talk to your local plant nerds, the people that are real experts. They sit there, and they, they go through neighborhoods, and they see a fine specimen of, of purple robe locusts. They go, whoa, 
it does grow. Look what it does. It grows in these dimensions. That's what that silver berry or Eliagnus or native yucca or there it is growing wild. And they just track this all the time. Then they can share that information with you so that you don't make a mistake. And, and again, yeah, okay, you're going to pay a couple dollars more at your local independent, but you'll get a better quality plant and you'll get much better quality advice. So you're not going to make as many mistakes. You may pay a little bit more per plant, but you'll pay a far less for the gardening experience because you just be, have more successes under your belt. A lot of this stuff has to go with, like we just got back from Portland, Oregon. We're, we're actually walking the fields, picking the plants. And this is what my trained eye is looking for. I'm looking for a farmer. So I don't grow my own spruce. They, it's like a 10-year crop. I have some, I have friends that grow them for us. And so I'll walk the field and I go, Oh, I'm looking for the fine root hairs in the hole. So it's field grown. Then it's ball and burlapped. Then it's transferred to a container. Then from there it's rooted out into that pot. And then it's brought to the nursery. It's quite a process. It takes about nine months. So we're doing that right now. I'm walking the fields and I'm looking, has this farmer been root pruning as the plant was growing? So when it's a seedling, it puts on a little taproot. Well, you need to cut that so it forms two taproots. Then you need to cut it again so it forms eight taproots. And so you'll get this more fibrous root mass, critical in an arid, dry area. It's the game. It's a game changer. It's between success and failure. Uh, if you get the wrong grower, even though it looks nice, it'll look great until next spring. And then the heat will come in the middle of May. And then June will vaporize it and will turn brown all like in one weekend, turn brown and die. That's because it wasn't root pruned correctly when it was a seedling growing up. So it's the wrong grower. So you got to have that kind of experience. You need a, you need a garden or nursery you can go to that's looking after your best interest. That's got some experience that can share that and help up your game, increase your success rate. Many of those garden successes, you, your failures that you had, honestly, it may not have been your fault. I mean, it could have been the rain, could have been environment, can be insects, can be some stuff. So that's, that's gardening. But sometimes it's just the plant was wrong. It wasn't healthy when you got it. And you can't tell just by the, the foliage mass. You have to look at the roots sometimes. And so that's what a good garden center does. And so if you're from uh, California, if you're from Scottsdale, you really need to ask some help. You need to take your time. I know it's impulsive to just go buy that beautiful pansy basket. There's huge mums. But did you know that many of your mums are grown in greenhouses? And they're not meant even once to be planted outdoors. They're meant to be enjoyed at the Thanksgiving dinner or indoors for or outdoors until the hard freeze comes. And they are designed to die. If you planted one of those and you think you're a gardener, you put it out there and it dies, you're going, oh, my, my, it's me. It's all my poor brown thumbs. It's not you. It's greenhouse grown, never intended to be grown outside. There's a whole series. We grow all of our moms outdoors on the ground so that they're used to the sun, the shade, and they will transition. They're even hardier moms than others. There's some species that take a four-season harsh cold climate better than others. You need to buy that one if you want to transfer it into the garden. And so right now we've got a, a lot of evergreens coming because we're gearing up for that Christmas, living Christmas tree, the holidays. We're just getting more specimens and that living tree thing is a big deal. And more importantly, we sell even more evergreens for privacy. Just people have been used to that open lot for many, many years. And all of a sudden there's a huge house right there in your face, looking at your bedroom where we're, we're, we seem to be having a lot of our planting crews are out almost every day, putting a hedgerow in uh, plant you know, tall evergreens to kind of for privacy, that private garden thing. So you can sip tea on your back patio and, and not have your neighbors glaring in at you. So it's partly for that. And so we've got this whole series, a, a lot of maples, a lot of aspens are coming. So fresh new stock and they're, the uh, maples, I just put them on Instagram. They're stunning. They're the biggest trunks I've seen, the biggest head or crown on it. Oh, they're magnificent. You plant them now, and you in a month, you'll just have that 
beautiful red fall color coming in your own backyard. Got a lot of garden advice for you this week. Tune in. Uh, we got Lisa Watersland coming up in just a moment. You're listening to local garden expert Ken Lane, also known as the Mountain Gardener. Ken can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Listen each week as he answers timely garden questions unique to mountain landscapes. Hi, Ken here with the Plants of the Week and our timeless beauty, Desert Willow. Large, fragrant burgundy and lavender flowers appear in big, bold clusters all summer long. This unusual water selection is prized for its long bloom time without setting the usual seed pods. The flowers are highly attracted to hummingbirds, 100% Arizona native, and just $49. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love their native plants to bloom, they love to shop. Hi, Kenneth Waters with our Monster Monsoon Sale, our only sale of the year. Truckloads of fresh autumn maple, aspen, and spruce have just arrived, and we need room, so summer plants must go. Perennials, trees, shrubs, even pottery must go, and it's worth your while with plant sales at 25, 45, even 65% off. It's Waters' only sale of the year at Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. Where people who love great plants at sale prices, they love to shop. You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. Okay, we are back with Lisa Waters Lane coming in the studio. She's got your garden questions going on. So Lisa just helps me feel all the Facebook, Instagram seems like the uh, the uh, newsletter that we put out each week generates a lot of questions. So mm-hmm. they're just not sure. It's this transition season. So it's important to hear what other folks are are asking. We can learn a lot from, from your neighbors. So that's what this is meant to, to be. Welcome to the studio, Lisa. Thank you. So what's new with you? <laughs> Other than busy, I see the greenhouses are totally changed over with uh, fall, fall colored. Another uh, transition time of year. Yeah, 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 it is. Yeah, so you bring in your cool season stuff, your snaps, your ornamental kales. Pansies will be arriving any day. So yeah. Yeah, that's good. I like this season. Fall is probably my best, what? my favorite what? gardening <laughs> season. <laughs> My favorite season is summer because I like to play. I like the outdoors and I like the heat. Mm-hmm. I'm just a heat guy. I'm a lizard. I'm crawling up on a rock and just warm up throughout the day and I just love it. Mm-hmm. So suntans and the fall, it bothers me a little bit because the days get shorter and I just know what's coming. <laughs> 19 degrees with a prevailing wind that oh, bites yeah. through you. All three days that we get that in the wintertime. <laughs> well, I don't like either one of those three. I'd rather have three days of 100 than three days of 19. Oh, so, no, 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 no. Yeah, you're the gal that sleeps the windows open in yes. January and goes, the covers are still too thick. <laughs> I'm freezing going, can you? Can we snuggle? I can't. I'm freezing. <laughs> you have a little hat you wear. At night. <laughs> <laughs> so before we go into our sleep habits. <laughs> <laughs> Which I'm sure everybody's yeah, interested in. Fully interested. We're all engaged now on the, hold on, let me pull over so I can tune in better. <laughs> What what kind of garden question do we have? <laughs> oh, okay, fine. We'll go to the boring stuff. No. Our first question is from Jack. Jack moved from Ohio, where fall was a really big planting season. Yeah. Heavily promoted back there. Did a lot of plantings in the fall. He wants to know, does that hold true here? Is it still a good time to plant? It is, yeah. So same, same thing. Four season climates, that's generally the case. The difference between the Midwest and here, the mountains of Arizona, we're still very much like that. Uh, you can plant. It's fabulous. The negative is we our ground doesn't freeze like the Midwest does. So I've got a buddy of mine. He winters over in uh, uh, Sedona. Eight-foot frost lines in Wisconsin, which is why he leaves. It's too cold. So you can plant there. The plant will start to root out. So as the leaves change color and they bring all those carbohydrates, they store all those carbs down in the root structure. So you get more roots when you plant in the fall. That's the beauty. That's why you do it. Mm. Uh, And you can get some bigger specimens. So you get larger caliber trees, nicer crown, because it's basically last spring's tree and it's flushed out. So you get all this growth. So you get more dollar, more value Mm -hmm. uh, per garden dollar by planting now. That's why they do that. 
Here, the difference is we don't get consistent moisture and we don't, our ground does not freeze consistently. So the plants don't truly shut down. They don't truly hibernate like they would in the Midwest. That's why we preach to folks or let them know you should water at least twice a month through the winters. Every couple of weeks, pick a nice day. You know, you've been pent up and indoors too long, sipping tea and baking cookies. It's time to get outdoors with some fresh air, drag the hose out with you or turn the irrigation on and just water things real deep. And if you get a, get a rain event or a snow event, you can take one of those out, but at least once a week you need to, or once a month, you need to water. That's the key difference. It's those Midwesterners that come in and plant, fully commit, turn the irrigation off in November, and then don't turn it back on in until April. And they wonder why their trees is because the ground didn't freeze to shut them down. And there wasn't enough natural rain. That's the main difference. Mm-hmm. But if you do that, the ground doesn't freeze. So the plants root even more than in the Midwest. Uh, the ground doesn't freeze. We, if you did give it some moisture, it really tends to flush out. This really plays out with your evergreens. So you can get larger buds uh, on your photinias, on your eleagnus, on your spruce, on your cedars. You can actually get more growth than you could in the Midwest mm-hmm. simply by planting the fall and keeping them hydrated and then fertilizing a couple times. So their plants are active here. Right. That's true. Very good. All right. Peter from Prescott Valley had an issue with grubs early on in the season in his lawn. He thinks he's gotten rid of the grubs, but he wants to know, is it an okay time to reseed? Yeah. In fact, uh, we're coming. The, what the book says, local book, local garden book says March and October are the best times to sod or seed Uh, because it's so mild. Grass is like very cool nights. Mm -hmm. Well, it's been so wet, so moist. I think you can start early. I mean, it's middle of September. I I think you're fine. Go now. Uh, If it does get up, you know, we have these Indian summers where it gets cool and then it warms back up. If it warms back up, then water a little bit more. Midday should be fine, but it will germinate within almost hours right now. I mean, it's you put Mm -hmm. seed, a bluegrass or ryegrass or fescue down right now, it will germinate by the end of the week. It's, you'll see little green tufts coming up. So it'd be great to recover from that. But the main thing, watch for grubs because the beetles have been laying their eggs now. The damage is done late summer, early fall, and then early next spring. So really keep an eye on that. If you've had grub issues, you'll probably have grub issues again because mm-hmm. the beetles know that's the best place. They right. like that. And you're in the middle of beetle uh, alley, so to speak. So grubs are a, a beetle larva. So it's a worm that eats, lives in the ground two years and eats the roots off of plants. And they love lawns. They love flower beds. But I've seen them eat trees, uh, rhododendrons. You would think rod- rhodes are poisonous to deer and rabbits, but not to grubs. Mm-hmm. Eating the roots. I've seen that literally fall over. So if you've seen that, we've got a, uh, an area in our gardens lower b- below the dry wash where grubs just love. It's underneath the junipers. And so I just put grub killer down every year, every fall. I just put it down just to keep it as a preventative. Mm-hmm. So one application will usually keep them away for a year. So that's one, just kind of watch that. I predict sure. you might even have grubs in Presque Valley now because it's been so moist, so nice. You, right. It could be. Okay. Never never give up your defenses against grubs. No, always give it's just You're <laughs> yeah. in nature, so you got to always be your gardening right. with nature. Mm-hmm. And if you're in an area where grubs show up, well, that's, that's nature's yeah. way of Beware. saying, hey, yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, Dana wa- has moved into a new home. She wanted to put out a bird feeder to attract birds. Neighbors told her, which is very true, you put out a bird feeder, bird seed, you're going to have javelina okay. and birds. <laughs> so her question is, what can she plant that would be good attractors oh, sure. for birds? That's a good idea, actually, yeah. So you are going to get pack rats and mice, and the birds don't eat all of the seed. There are better quality seeds, so you get less milo. That's the stuff they throw off. So you have less weed, but still you're going to get some of that spill factor. Mm-hmm. Birds are messy. So other things are attracted to that. So plants that you could put out there, this is a great time because uh, number one, uh, you mentioned last week, echinacea mm-hmm. or coneflower. There's so many varieties and birds just love them. Uh, they're bright and cheery. They come in pinks and yellows and, and uh, purples. Uh, but they'll grow up about, I don't know, 18 inches tall, put on the seed head. And so the birds will use that as a food source through winter. Gallardia. 
mm-hmm. is the same exact thing. It's been blooming since April. You can plant one now, and it will continue to bloom through the end of the year. And then you'll let those flowers go to seed, and then it will be a food source for your your goldfinches and things that winter over with you. Mm -hmm. It's a great source. Of course, the number one are any of those summer bloomers, grape myrtles, uh, autumn sage, autumn joy sedum, I find is a really good uh, bird attractor. Mm -hmm. It's a tall sedum, like a cactus without um, the thorns. Uh, but birds will peck away at the flesh using it as a food source very, very early in spring when, before mm-hmm. the weeds, before the grasses come up. So it's a, okay. it's a very much a carryover for them. Mm-hmm. So you get more chickadees, more things coming through. Also, I notice our Swiss chard. Yeah. You plant Swiss chard and the birds just love to eat that as much mm-hmm. as you do. So we always plant an extra Swiss chard just for them mm-hmm. or enough so it's more than we could eat so the birds we kind of pick through the birds ones the birds eat it's a tremendous bird attractor we have a list here at the garden center called uh, how to attract birds it's got a mm-hmm. list of all the plants the birds like to roost in or eat mm-hmm. and it's hummingbirds and smaller smaller birds right. come in it's free it's a good way to list it's a list you can go through the nursery and, and pick which ones you you like yourself so that's that's bird gardening 101 or come talk to lisa <laughs> Our whole backyard is nothing but that is true for birds. Yep. Okay, Ken Elisa Lane and the Mountain Gardeners be right back with more after this. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Hi, Waters with our annual native plant sale. No scraggly natives here. These are big, bold local specimens bound to inspire. From native pines to the largest selection of agave and yucca, even Waters cactus are blooming in celebration. The landscape doesn't have to be natural and boring. We specialize in native wildflowers that bloom locally for easy care color. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love local natives, they love to shop. High Waters with the Plants of the Week and our Buzz Butterfly Bush. Buzz is Prescott's first patio-sized butterfly bush. The superior magenta flowers outshine our local natives and the perfect size for courtyards and patios. Add some fashion color to that native landscape or simply give to mom as a gift. It's simply that pretty, all for under $40. You'll only find them at Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love magenta flowers love to shop. You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. Now I had mentioned that uh, fall is a good time to plant. I thought I would cover how to plant. Now this is for mainly trees, bigger shrubs. This is the technique that you want to use. So, and we've seen this play out this uh, last monsoon season. It's been wet and some of the plants have been stressed out. You're planting so that next monsoon season, you can shed some of this water away from the roots because plants get overwatered this time of year. So you want to set up for a super wet March and super wet August and September. Those are our two wet spots where damage can occur to plants because of the heavy clay soil, the the moisture content, the sheer quantity of moisture we get all at once, and then the water can't perk away. The soil won't release that water away from the roots, so you get what's called root rot. And so this planting technique helps with This is critical for you folks way up Williamson Valley, up towards Seligman, heavy, heavy clays. Uh, The 69 corridor from... Prescott, downtown Prescott, right all the way out to Prescott Valley, Dewey, Mayer, Humboldt, uh, uh, Cortis Junction. Heavy, heavy clays. You folks down the Verde next to next to the river, that heavy silt, that's it. Just doesn't perk. So these are this technique helps with that. Most of us have very heavy clay soils in the mountains of Arizona, and so you're you're planting uh, to help the help the plants root that way. In the natives, you'll see this played out. So you see a new subdivision or new home going in, they bulldoze over that uh, that big juniper or, or aspen or, or 
uh, box elder, you'll see it tipped over and there's no roots underneath it. It's like goes down about 18 inches and then a tap root comes off. I call it the hockey puck, hockey stick, big old tap root. And then it turns and runs just underneath the ground, hundreds of feet underneath the ground. And that's also why they don't transplant. Natives just really don't transplant out of the wild into your yard because it has one root and you've severed it. It's got a hundred foot long root and you severed it three feet from the trunk. It's just all the roots gone. So they don't transplant. So when you're planting, you want to think like a native. So the roots are not going to go down. They're going to go sideways. So when you dig your hole, you're only digging as deep as the bucket that you're planting. So if you bought a 15 gallon plant, maybe that's an 18 inch hole. That's how deep that bucket is. A tin, a squat, 10 gallons, maybe 14 inches, a little five gallons, maybe a foot. So you're only digging as deep as the bucket, but you're planting uh, three buckets wide and kind of round shaped. So you're going much wider than deeper because the roots go out sideways, just underneath the surface of the soil, because that's where the water, the nutrients are. They're not going down. There's just more rock and gunk down there for them. There's all the nutrients and the good stuff is up close. Uh, that lightning storm that loads up the rain with nitrogen and then rains down on the plants. The plants know this is the best rain ever and it wants to pick that up. So it's just underneath the surface of the of the soil. Even the biggest of trees maybe has roots going down 24 or 36 inches deep. Most of the roots are, are very shallow. And so dig a hole that way. Now, this is heavy clay soil. It compacts right back down to solid rock, especially in the summer in June. So you want to add some organics. Plus, many of you don't have any organic in your soil. There's nothing there for them. So you need to, you need to that top soil your contractor scraped off to put your footers in, you need to re- you need to add some organics to that and not manure so much. You want really composted bark mulch. So we've got one called premium mulch. It's made just for planting trees and shrubs in the ground. You want to take about one shovel of mulch to two shovels of, of native soil. So you want to blend that together. So we're trying to reintroduce some organics in the soil so the worms will come in, the mycorrhizal fungi, things will start colonizing. It will start gathering around this new garden that you made, this new tree or shrub. So any rocks you come into, throw them away. Anything bigger than a golf ball, throw it away. Any roots in the ground, throw it away. They're bad. So you want to screen. Some of you will have to screen pretty heavy. <laughs> it's all rocks. So then you're going to use that mulch and soil back blended, and then you want to backfill around and stomp around that root ball. You do not want that root to be below grade. You want it to be at grade or even a little above grade. You might even leave a couple inches of root out of the ground and then mound that mulch and, and native soil mint blend, mound it up and just cover up that, that root ball. That way, at least, even the heaviest of monsoon rains, that at least two inches of roots can breathe. You'll find your mortality rate drops dramatically. It's a game changer in Prescott Valley. Uh, all, all That whole valley or all the way up to Chino Valley, Paul, and it's just heavy clay. That'll help that, that plant to breathe, even in the heaviest of rain. Then you're going to fertilize it because there's no nutrients in your ground. You're going to sprinkle when you're all done. You're going to sprinkle some all-purpose plant food around the root ball. And you're going to water it in with root and grow and water. So you need three things whenever you plant. Mulch, some food, uh, transplant food, either real slow release or I like the organic uh, 744 all-purpose. And then a root and grow is a, it's a transplant shock and rooting hormone. So you water it in when it's all done with this root and grow and it helps to form new root hairs. That's what you do. If you're planting a tree, you do want to stake it. Uh, big, uh, fruit trees, uh, big shade trees, they, they catch the wind. They start to lean into the northeast. Big evergreens like spruce and pine, they'll load up with snow here at the end of the year. And they'll just kind of like you, you root it out some and then all of a sudden they just fall over. It doesn't kill them, but you broke all those new root hairs. So you want to stake it just for a year and then you unstake it because the roots are now thick enough to keep it upright. That's what you do. Mulch, food, root and grow, and stakes for trees. And that's how you plant. I've got a free handout here at Waters Garden Center. It's there for you. It's got, this, it's got pictures. It's got, well, it tells you how much of each. goes into details if you need more on how to plant in Arizona. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden experts and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. 
Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. In a new place, it's difficult to know who to trust, how to get help at the house, and which nursery will simply do what they say they'll do. At Waters Garden Center, we're here to help, in the landscape at least. Our team of plant ambassadors know your neighborhood, the plants that add color, increase privacy, and add fragrance and beauty. And we can show you exactly how to plant locally, or we have teams to do all the work for you. We are Ken and Lisa Lane, and we guarantee our plants will live up to every promise here at Waters Garden Center. I hate weeds. Monsoon rains are so refreshing, even my landscape comes alive, but so do my weeds. Stop weeds in their track in one simple step. Water's weed and grass stopper spreads like fertilizer. It kills weed seed before monsoon rains allow them to sprout. No need to weed. It's safe for trees, even flower beds, and so much safer than that toxic waste the big box sells. Weed and grass stopper. It's just $24 and only found at Water's Garden Center in Prescott. And we are back with Lisa Waters Lane in our inspiration section. This is the area where if you just want more fragrance, more beauty, more privacy, more color, uh, more blooms, more vegetables, Lisa, this is all about her and anything she's got in her head, we share and it's it's uh, kind of makes us all a better gardener. So you have, I would define your gardens, Lisa, at least mm-hmm. the front area uh, where it's main, that's your thumbprint as beauty. Uh-huh. relaxation, Thank you. Uh, kind of therapy, kind of yeah. just, you just want to sit down and just take it in it's from, mm-hmm. from the sound of running water at the distance to hummingbirds floating across to chickadees eating sand out of yeah. the pavers uh, and everything. It's just fun to be out there in the mm-hmm. morning, sipping coffee, or we like to hang out there at the I- end of the day, sipping wine or right. talking to neighbors, hanging with the dogs. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, I think that's what a garden should be, uh, therapy, but you, that's kind of your, your bailiwig. My bailiwig? Where did that or word bailiwick. even come from? <laughs> bailiwick. Uh, Where's a bailiwick? I don't know. I'm from the South. I, I, <laughs> let me Google that. Siri. <laughs> Google. Help. It's, it's kind of Make sad me sound intelligent. We, we, yeah, really. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things I heard was that using Google or Siri has taken people away from having conversations uh, or lighthearted, yeah. you know, battles with each other because you can just look it up and go, well, here it is right here. Whereas before you used to chit chat and go, no, I think you're wrong. Oh, or, debates you know, or something. Right. Mm-hmm. I wonder if that's affected debate clubs and that kind of stuff. I don't, it, I don't know. You know, I went off, we visit, we visited the kids like a month ago mm-hmm. and I forgot my phone. I know. I and thought he was going to have a heart attack folks. I, you know, it was the best <laughs> thing. It was like a, a digital sabbatical, mm-hmm. like like a like a a fasting, but instead yeah. of you know biblical food, I fasted from technology, and you felt better afterwards. You played with the grandkids more, and you didn't feel like you had to go check. Now I did have my laptop, so I could yeah. still check stuff, but it wasn't. <laughs> but my phone wasn't on me all the time, yeah. which you know, it's always going off. So mm-hmm. sometimes I have to put it on the uh, do not disturb list because you just can't. You, you can't do a radio show if it's always right. going off. You can't write a column. You can't, you can't, it's too distracting. Mm-hmm. It truly is distracting. Yes. But anyways, I thought that was interesting that it, it took away from conversations that you would have basically about nothing because <laughs> neither one of you could really prove it, but now you can prove it because you got Siri. And blah, Maybe blah, blah, it blah. feeds into our political biases or our, uh, I don't know. I don't know. That's a, that's another. Usually, when I see your political that. diatribe going through my Facebook feed, I just go, bah, "I'm not interested. I don't care. I don't know. Just move right through." That's why I kind of went. I well, I went off Facebook because I just I you, got. You can't say that over the airwaves. This is going to be podcasted. We want people taking in the content. What? Well, for me personally, I just had to give it up. It was too disturbing, wow. and not that people were bad. It just kind of went. Why? Why do I care about hmm. it? <laughs> but watch but, the kids. Yeah, you know, she, she'll it's... usually text me pictures. Oh, and that's stuff true. Now. Yeah. So yeah, there's that's other even better anyway. To yeah. Do but anyways, that's me, and that's a whole other story. Don't worry, folks. I'm fully connected in every angle. <laughs> I can barely oh, get any work me. done because it's just like yes. continual conversation coming in my ears, and I can't. It's coming so fast, you can't even respond. It's ridiculous. Hmm. We'll but have, to have a talk about that. As a small business owner, yes, you, you're competing against these these massive boxes with million dollar ad budgets. 
mm-hmm. you can actually add personality and be more relevant oh, sure. through this new technology that's out. Mm-hmm. So the little guy can actually take on the, is yeah. David take on the Goliath and win because right. you've got the connections in the community. And, and it, I find it's yeah. really quite helpful uh, for yeah, folks. I'm not saying it's all bad. It's just a personal decision that I made for me. Okay. But I'm not saying it's horrible and the people that use Facebook are horrible and, oh, my goodness, not going there. I'm not going to Facebook message you anymore. Not like I ever did. You never but. did. <laughs> <laughs> True. We should get to the topic at hand because we could go down this path over the entire show. That is true. We manage bunny trails. So right now we're kind of, at least in my own garden, I'm switching over a lot of my pots, things in my pots because – Number one, they're just looking ratty. Like some of my petunias just stay too yeah. wet during the monsoons, and wet feet on petunias are not happy campers. So they're just looking ratty. The worms had gotten to them. I thought, yeah, it's time to switch them out. So I started thinking, you know, it's it's a it's a good time to look for those perennials and annuals that you want to put in your yard that give you great late summer, early fall color. Because every garden has seasonality to it, right? So you, you know, you look for the things early in the spring that look terrific, and then you get the heat of the summer, and you look for your geraniums and your marigolds, and now it's time to look for those things that like more cool season stuff. And this kind of stuff you can plant now, and it will keep even a mum. Mm-hmm. I love mums because there, there's nothing more. They're so full of flowers you can't even see the foliage. It's amazing. They go with pumpkins and gourds and all this. It just screams mm-hmm. scarecrows and Halloween and fall. Uh, but even when they fade, mm-hmm. they have this beautiful straw color and the structure is vase-shaped and it's like a big pom-pom that, that's just <laughs> like been been frozen in time and, and straw-colored. Mm-hmm. It's still beautiful. Right. And now we'll keep it there by the hot tub until the seed heads start floating off and all the petals start floating into the hot tub and going, okay, that's enough. You're out of here. That's, that's usually January, February before that right. happens. Right. There's a lot of perennials that's, because we don't freeze early here, yeah. that just keep blooming and blooming and blooming and look gorgeous late, late into fall. Thanksgiving, I think last year I had some that were just yeah, absolutely true. stunning at yeah. Thanksgiving. Mid, I think it was mid-December before things truly, even even the geraniums collapse mm-hmm. in December. It's crazy. And that's what new folks that, that, that maybe have tuned in. Uh, we have what's Indian summer. I don't know why they call it that. And it's almost offensive. Native sure, American I'm sure summer. I'm some offensive reason why. <laughs> it's, it's, it's this false. It, it, you think it's fall. And he goes, nope, it's summer again. Mm-hmm. And then it goes, nope, it's going to be fall again. And then, nope, it's summer again. Just like spring. Mm-hmm. You think it's really nice weather. And then it goes to winter. Think it's really nice weather. And then it goes to winter. So you need plants that can, can take that. Them. Yeah. Sure. So sure. what kind of plants can we put in pots Right or now. in the ground. Even. Or in the ground. Okay. You bet. Well, I think one of my f- my favorites right now that are just looking terrific is anything in the echinacea or the cone flower family. Yeah. Um, most people remember the traditional purple one, but they're coming up with some colors like the Cheyenne Spirit is yellow with oranges. Uh, the powwow berry is a bright, bright, like pink, neon pink. Yeah. Um, sombreros and salsas that are really red colors that really lend themselves nicely to fall that fall palette you know that you want to bring in and they'll just keep blooming their little hearts out until we get a really hard frost and they're great for the birds too which i think we mentioned that in another yeah. segment of how the birds just pull that seed if you let the seed head dry on there um, they like that seed plus it can reseed in your yard as well so that's kind of one of my favorites right now for putting in um the other one I really like is the, uh, a salvia that's called ultraviolet. Oh. And the reason I like this one, it is actually very cold hardy, more so than the autumn sage or the um, other salvias, the hot lips, that kind of thing. This one is much more hardy. It does have a purple bloom to it, but it's going to bloom a lot longer because it's so cold tolerant. Oh, interesting. Very so nice purple, one. is it lavender or true purple? It's Pretty much a true purple. Really? It's oh, nice. It's darker than lavender. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's very, very What's nice. What's the name of that again? It's ultraviolet. Ultraviolet. Salvia. Sounds like a superhero. Yeah, it sounds like a superhero. Yeah. <laughs> Going to take on like a Batman. This is uh, ultraviolet. Right. <laughs> um, one that we have in right now is Monarda, which is bee balm, if people aren't familiar with that. They have a new one called BU Be Free. Um, and the great thing about this one is it fights the powdery mildew. Now, a lot of 
people, if they're familiar with that, bee balm gets powdery mildew because of the time of year, you know, with the moisture. This one does it. It's very resistant to that. And the flower is just like this purple, knock your socks off color. It's a tall flower, too. It's an herb. Yeah. So animals are going to be less likely to eat it. And then gets mm-hmm. up probably about hip high, maybe a little, little shorter than that. It's a tall thing. And it's, it's beautiful. a great pollinator oh, yeah. plant. Yeah. Absolutely Plants. fabulous for pollinators. Uh, snapdragons, which, of course, we've mentioned. Who doesn't love snapdragons? I love oh snapdragons. Yeah. They, animals don't eat them. They bloom forever. They'll even winter over. They'll probably take a break in the deep of winter, but they just keep on going. So check out the snaps and, of course, the mums. Of course, and a yeah. bunch of other things. The grasses. The grasses look fabulous right now. So lots of things you can plant now that are coming in. So if it's kind of the summer things are out and the whole greenhouse has been shifted over to things you can plant and enjoy through the end of the year. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Lisa. Okay, Ken and Lisa Lane and the Mountain Gardeners. Be right back. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Brasithia already flowered? Hylax languishing in the heat? Spring bloomers already pooped? Butterfly bushes are going strong and rebloom all summer long. Pollinators like butterflies and hummingbirds love butterfly bush for their fantastic fragrance and bright summer colors. These tough head high beauties love summer sun and bloom nonstop. Fresh new plants just arrived at the place where people who love butterflies and butterfly bushes, they love to shop. Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Hi Kenneth Waters with our Monster Monsoon Sale, our only sale of the year. Truckloads of fresh autumn maple, aspen, and spruce have just arrived, and we need room, so summer plants must go. Perennials, trees, shrubs, even pottery must go, and it's worth your while with plant sales at 25, 45, even 65% off. It's Waters' only sale of the year at Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. Where people who love great plants at sale prices, they love to shop. So we mentioned how to plant trees and shrubs at the bottom of the hour, uh, bottom of the show. Why don't we go over the exact trees? Which ones seem to grow the best here in northern Arizona? And, and it's going to be totally different than down in, in the valley or the desert areas, the Tucson area. Uh, all those deserts, a river uh, country, a bullhead city. Uh, have I mean, all those areas, they're hot. Our plants won't grow there. You can't Plant a pine tree, a spruce down there. They'll just vaporize in summer. They'll live through winter, then they'll vaporize. So these are plants for us in the mountains, from, from Kingman to the White Mountains, from Holbrook and Flagstaff and Williams down to, I'd say, all the way down to Black Canyon City, those areas, that just, as you, just before you transition down the hill uh, into the deserts, all of us. Of course, Sedona, Camp Verde, Cottonwood, all those areas, this, this is for us, okay? Here's the, here's the selection. Of course, aspens grow wild in the mountains. We're surprised when you put them on irrigation, they'll go down, they'll grow. I've seen them down to 4,000 foot level. So I've seen them Skull Valley, Baghdad, uh, Kirkland, uh, not Baghdad, but Kirkland, uh, uh, those areas. It does really well. So at the higher elevations, they'll naturalize in a couple of years and can go on their own. But here locally, you put them on a drip system, treat them like anything else, and you'll have that classic white bark. Did you know there's two types of aspen, though? There's Swedish aspen. Swedish, it's got a different leaf to it. Very white bark, but the leaf is more uh, serrated and doesn't tremble, doesn't doesn't have that motion that, that your local native does. Populus tremuloides, or trembling leaf as, uh, poplar, that's, that is actually our aspens. That's the one that you want to grow. So that's one we have here. It comes in multi-trunks or single trunks. Very good choice. Birch is a similar one. It's got a white bark. Has, actually, birch looks more like a Swedish aspen than, than, a, than a local native. It's more robust, a little bit hardier. It'll go longer without water. Uh, has a little bit more, I don't know, it's just less, less weedy, less uh, suckery coming up. Than an aspen does. So there's some pros and cons to both. But I would say look at the birch if you like aspens. And if you've got a big row, big long row, change it up. Make a garden esque kind of feel to it along that 100 foot fence line. Put several different types 
of trees in there. This is especially important if you're trying to cut down you know, headlight traffic, noise, dust control down that dirt road. Uh, what we find is different textures, different types of trees, different heights mitigate uh, much of that sound wave or dust particles better than just a solid row of Arizona cypress. So change it up. That's one. Take a picture and a, bring a measurement. We can help you blend things together well. We can even plant it for you if you need to. Um, look at elms. Elms, local. Don't, don't look at the local elm, the weedy elm. It puts on seeds, gets an elmly skeletonizer, has a slime flux. If there's 10 diseases in the, in the local area, our, our native Siberian elm will get, uh, that, that particular elm will get you know, eight of them. It's ridiculous. I'll probably get 12 of them. But there's new varieties of elm, including the new American elms, like you see downtown uh, Prescott. Those are American elms, big leaf elms. Uh, there's some new varieties that are very robust. They, the uh, elm leaf skeleton, skeletonizer does not like it. It doesn't get slime flux. It doesn't throw off seed heads. Uh, some of the new varieties like Ali and Frontier, they actually have a red fall color. They've got an elm that turns red in the fall. Fast growing, hardy, no, no problems, and it turns red. That's a good tree for the mountains of Arizona. So, so, so don't, don't discount it. Uh, so, but, but I don't sell the native weedy one. That would just be like selling weeds. I wouldn't do that to you, but I have some of the better varieties. Maples are probably a number. Aspens are number one seller here at the garden center, at least. And maples are right behind them. And mainly people are wanting that, that big leafed maple. This is not, not Japanese maple. This is a, a shade tree type of, of maple. So it's blaze, petticoat, uh, um, matador celebration. There's several different names for a similar kind of tree, fast growing red maple. Uh, they're very good. They grow up to about 35 feet by 25 feet, classic shade tree uh, and famous for its fall oranges and reds. I mean, very bright. I mean, when they turn color at uh, the end of October, I mean, people will pull over and go, Oh, that's so pretty. What is that? They'll ask you, they'll ask you what variety? Go, well, Tell you what, you go down to Waters Garden Center and they got this variety of, of blaze maple. And that's, that's how pretty they are. So that's, that's why they're so popular. Take a really close look at the Regal Petticoat Maple. It's a new, brand new sugar maple found out of Canada. Takes harsh cold. It's got a thick leaf, so it takes dryness. It's a slower grower. It will get up to size, but it'll be about half the pace of, let's say, a blaze maple. So it's much less need for pruning, for shaping, for, for crowning, um, easier to maintain. And the interesting thing about Regal Petticoat, it's got a two-toned leaf. It's green on the top and purple on the bottom. Super unusual. And the top turns orange in the fall of the year, and the bottom turns a, a fuchsia color. Super interesting maple leaf, classic maple leaf, but just has a lot going on for it. Very pretty tree and very new. One that is probably the one that turns the very last tree to turn red in the fall of the year are your ornamental pears. There's, there's actually fruiting pears. They would also turn real late, but they put on fruit. Many of you don't want the fruit off of a tree. Some of you do plant a pear tree. But there's a whole series of ornamental pears. They get the same white flower in the spring, have the same glossy leaf in the summer, great shade tree up to about 30 feet by 15 to 20 feet. It's a nice shade tree for the middle of the yard. Uh, very robust, very limited insect issues, low care. But it's the, about Thanksgiving. It turns this just profound red. I mean, it's just bright like fire engine, even even deeper red than a fire engine red, very bright red. And then about Thanksgiving, first part, middle of December at the latest, it's done. And now we're into winter. And then all your evergreens start to show off. This is when your spruce and your pines and your firs and your cedars and your cypress, they start taking center stage. Uh, that's when they like to really shine. That's when that, that you know people will come in going, I don't know the name of this tree but it looks like a Christmas tree. Okay, that's going to be a spruce. There's only one thing that looks like that, and that's a, spru a spruce. There's several varieties of spruce. You go with hoop's eye spruce. does very well in the mountains. You've got uh, baccarat spruce. 
very super bright silver blue. It's not blue. It's silver. It's that kind of classic central leader, swooping branches, but silver. Of course, the most famous of all of them are the Colorado spruce. And then the dwarf of the Colorado is called Fat Albert spruce. All of them do really, really well at all elevations here in the mountains. Uh, they'll take our snow. They'll take our cold. Uh, you can plant them now. You can decorate them in a couple months, make them look all festive and holiday-ish, put some bows on them and some lights, and they're just cute as can be. Uh, we, we take one home and put them, we don't even take it out of the pot, put it by the front door, decorate it, just have it there. And then when you're done, we bring it back to the nursery and we sell it. But, uh, it's, it's, you can keep on going. You could go plant it right afterwards in the yard. If you need another spruce tree, here's, it's a decorative thing. And so they do really, really well. Probably the fastest growing of all of the evergreens is Deodor cedar. This is a monster of a tree. Be careful. You, you don't put it in a small yard. This takes some serious real estate. So the tree grows I mean, pretty short, short order. It will grow to 50 feet tall and 25 feet wide. I mean, if you put this thing by your house, your house will be obliterated. It would just be gone. Now, but, but if you need a, a, a quick-growing windbreak, if you've got a big yard, half acre plus, and the neighbor is now building that barn over there, you could plant it there and it would be gone. I mean, two of them and you'd have a solid 50-foot wall with these two Deodor cedars up there. It's a great tree when locally drought hardy, tough as nails, naturalizes. It's a great tree for you, but it's kind of too much tree for some of the smaller yards. They'd be better off going with some of your, your other varieties. And I could keep going and going. I've got resources here for, for tree lists, what grows well, what doesn't. Uh, we'd be glad to share that with you. But that's some of the ideas I have for you, at least for this show. Right now, you can plant now and get the most out of it in the fall of the year. Be right back. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Hi, Ken, with our Vine of the Week and our Arizona Sunset Trumpet Vine. Huge, deep red flowers cluster to create a dramatic summer show. This vigorous vine thrives and blooms with near neglect. Fast growing to cover chain link fence, shade structures, and trellis quick. Easy to train as a ground cover up a rock face to hold soils from erosion in just $34. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love vines that bloom red, they love to shop. Ouch! Aw, oh, man, another rock! Hi, I'm Rusty. You know, the shovel you're destroying trying to dig that hole? Sure, I get it. You got these beautiful plants at Waters Garden Center. Waters asked if they could plant them for you, but no. You had to do it yourself, even though they would plant, deliver, and guarantee your plants for two years. I hope I don't end up like that old pickaxe. Ouch! Prevent yard tool abuse. Waters Garden Center. They plant, deliver, and guarantee. You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now, welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. I mentioned at the bottom of the hour how to plant trees. And then I just went over, we just went over a whole list of some pretty substantial trees, pretty Nice looking trees. Best to plant trees in the fall. So you get that fall rooting. Uh, water them through winter a couple times a month. And then you'll get another flush of roots next spring. And then you'll get more top growth. You'll get more elongation on the candles of your evergreens. And you'll get longer branch structure on your uh, fruit trees and your shade trees. That's why it's so good to plant in the fall. Just make sure you water midwinter. If you're planting trees, especially especially evergreens, make sure you stake them. I see so many blunders, so many of my competitors, so many other folks go out and they, they plant them, go, ah, it's heavy enough, it'll stay up by itself. But, you know, four, five, six-foot spruce or pine or fir, and, and you load it up with snow in January, you've had another six inches of roots grow out on this plant, on the root ball, and it's, it's starting to establish. You've been watering. You've been caring for it. Then a heavy snow comes January. You get 50 pounds of snow load on this, this tree. It's fine. It doesn't hurt the tree. But then it, 
it just kind of flops over and it's laying crooked in the root, in, in, in the ground. Well, yes, you can prop it back up and yes, it will be fine. And yes, it will le- leaf out. Yes, it'll be, it's, it'll be healthy. But you lost all that, that six inches of root. You want to keep those. And so you stake them. So when our crews are coming out, we automatically, even squatty little four, three, four foot trees, we, we'll stake them. Uh, kind of make a little judgment call. We, we stake them because just in case we get this blizzard condition, blizzard event in the mountains of Arizona, which is possible. Uh, it, it will keep those roots rooting, and we don't we don't ever go backwards. We're only going forwards, and you only keep those stakes on for about a year. But that's kind of that's my advice for you. Um, and it doesn't seem like you should do it in the fall, but there there you should. Your big uh, fruit trees and shade trees they need it because they'll flush out next spring. Then they become these huge parachutes. Just they catch all the wind that prevailing southwest wind. Then they start to lean to the northeast, and all of a sudden you got this crooked tree. If you just staked it for a year or two, it's good to go. Yep. With that being said, if your tree has been staked for like five years, it's time. Commit. Take the stakes off. It should have been done three years ago. You, 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 it's okay. Stake, trees should only need to be staked two years maximum, really, really one year for a, a more substantial trunk or a taller evergreen or, or, or a, a evergreen. Okay. So that's my advice. We go into this a lot, uh, with our classes this Saturday. We've got, uh, several really good garden classes coming up. It's, uh, the secret garden, how to plant evergreens hedges for privacy. So if you've been wanting to screen out that neighbor, come this Saturday, nine 30 next week, it's how to deal with, with a deer and javelina and rabbits, and pack rats, and bugs, and grasshoppers. We're going over wildlife and bug prevention, just how to garden in nature without it taking over. Then we go into fruit trees, September 22nd. Every Saturday at 9.30, we've got a free garden class. Come out, get to hang out with really neat gardeners. But fruit trees, you know, which ones can you grow? How do you you deal with, we'll probably go into grapes, uh, peaches, apricots, nectarines, apples, pears, and this and the like, and then planting for success. We go hands on the last Saturday in September. How do you actually plant? We'll go deep into that subject with living examples. So it's, it's, I think it'll be a real plus for a lot of you. Of course, throughout the week, we love iPads, and iPhones, and just technology. Take a picture. Bring it in. We can see what companion plants are. You can zoom in. You can see a lot. It's amazing, this technology, but it's there to help us help you. Throughout the week, Lisa and I camp out here at Waters Garden Center. Come in, say hi. Tell us you've been listening to the show. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. This is Ken Lane, the owner of Waters Garden Center, and we're here at the Garden Center floor asking customers, why do you garden? Very relaxing and interesting, and I love watching the hummingbirds in the summer. And why do you like shopping at Waters Garden Center? There's so much variety, a lot of choice, and everybody knows everything about the stuff they sell, which is very good. Waters Garden Center, helping people reconnect. At 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, the place where people who love to garden, love to shop. You've been listening to local garden expert Ken Lane, the owner of Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Join him each week as he answers timely garden questions unique to the area. He can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center, located in Prescott at 1815 Iron Springs Road. Thanks for tuning in to The Mountain Gardener.